A very warm good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are uh, right now. Um, I'm Vinika Rao. I'm Executive Director of the INSEAD Africa Initiative and Asia Director of the Hoffman Institute. So on behalf of both of these institutes, it's a real pleasure to have you with us today. Uh, I hope you've been enjoying the previous events that we've um, you know, brought to you as part of this SDG week. I actually just stepped out of um, a wonderfully insightful conversation on building DNI into the workplace, uh, which was also you know, something that um, has left me with a lot of interesting thoughts. And now in this conversation, we will be talking on another very important topic. We'll be discussing the challenges created by climate change in Africa and the opportunities that we still have to address these issues. We know that like on the rest of the world, climate change is having a devastating impact on the African continent. It has created all sorts of problems, you know, food insecurities, stresses on water, depletion of human health, population displacement, and overall negatively impacted socioeconomic development in the continent. Many, if not most of these problems that the continent is facing are not of its own creation. And like elsewhere in the world, its consequences are being felt most by those who can afford it the least. So we'll talk about some of these issues, but our focus in this discussion is actually more on the possible solutions to reduce or counter them. We're seeing some amazingly innovative and effective solutions that are coming out from Africa that can benefit the continent itself and also provide much needed ideas for the rest of the world. So that's something that we really hope to be able to uh, discuss in this conversation today. Because to talk us through these, we have a great lineup of speakers whom I will introduce to you in a bit. Uh, we have with us uh, Mr. Akim Mohammed Dauda. Akim is the CEO of the Sovereign Wealth Fund of the Gabonese Republic, FGIS. In his current role, he oversees the execution of the fund strategy, supporting the government's plans towards energy transition and biodiversity promotion and protection. Recently, he also joined the World Economic Forum's Young Global Leaders Community. Very good to have you with us, Akim. Welcome. Um, next, we have with us Ms. Mrs. Pauline Kerbel, who is the founder and CEO at Afri Prospect. Um, she is uh, also the founder and managing partner at She Equity. Pauline is a gender lens impact investor and a leading innovation expert in developing and emerging economies. She Equity provides smart investment to impactful and scalable African female-led female and owned businesses, and Afri Prospect focuses on connecting African innovators with global markets. Welcome, Pauline. Great to have you with us. It's a pleasure also to welcome Ms. Hania Dawood, who's the Manager of Climate Finance and Economics at the Climate Change Group, World Bank. Hania leads a team to deliver thought leadership and external stakeholder engagement on innovative climate finance mechanisms, to deliver climate diagnostics and country level analytical work, and to scale up climate and carbon financing. Prior to this role, Hania was climate business development and strategy manager at IFC. Welcome Hania, great to have you with us. And I also want to welcome Mr. James Mwangi. James is the founder of Climate Action Platform for Africa, which is a public benefit organization working to drive economic transformation in Africa through large scale climate action that builds on its land and resources while also employing its young and growing workforce. James also co-founded the Dalber Group, a global collective of impact driven businesses working to build a more inclusive and sustainable world. His recent work has focused on leading Dalberg's partnership with a global foundation aimed at unlocking 30 million dignified jobs for African youth by 2030. And this has led him to focus on opportunities that climate action offers for inclusive and sustained economic growth in Africa. Welcome, James. Jean, Jean can we now shift the spotlight to our wonderful panelists uh, so you know, we can have them live with us. And I do want to say we are extremely fortunate to have managed to get these four incredible people to join us today. Um, their calendars are very tight. And so it's been amazing that they've come together for this conversation. So thank you once again for being with us. And um, I want to say that, uh, you know, we have with us also the president of our INSEAD Africa Business Club, uh, Demi, who will help me to moderate the questions that we get from the audience. 
And I think what uh, we might do is I'll start us off by asking a few questions of my own first, and then I'll start to take questions from the audience. So start sending in your questions now. Uh, and to our speakers, we want to keep this discussion quite informal. So even if the question is not addressed to you, you know, if there's something you want to add, by all means, please jump in. Feel free to add any comments um, or, or your own suggestions. And because we do want to get in as many questions as, as possible, I'll request that you keep your responses succinct. Okay, thank you. And with that, let me, um, you know, first uh, go to Akim and request you, Akim, to set the stage for us. Uh, by just you know outlining some of the key challenges uh, that Africa faces in terms of the impact of climate change. So to start the conversation rolling, over to you, Akin. Thank you, Vinika. Thank you, thank you. I'm really happy to be on this panel and uh, where, I, where we can see that we're taking um, uh, gender equity really seriously. Um, <laughs> that was a quick joke. Um, talking about um, climate change and the impact on Africa, I would like just maybe to frame it uh, a bit differently because um, African challenges are global challenges when we look at it. And when it comes to climate change, um, it's like um, we, we all, we're all facing the same storm, although we might be on different boats. But with the increasing intensity of the storm, no matter the size of the boat, it will tip over at some point. Uh, but why the, the focus on Africa is really uh, interesting is when we look at the data, you, you all have them. Uh, Africa only contributed to 3% of greenhouse gas emission worldwide. And when we look at the demographic, uh, by 2050, Africa, the population on the continent will have doubled. So this is really to say that as we going, uh, as we are approaching uh, COP next week, uh, the conversation that will take place uh, will really be around how the decision and the progress that will make that will be made on the continent in the next decades will impact the global development of the world. It will impact us all. Um, but we can also name few. I don't even know if it's challenges or impact that we're already seeing. We're seeing the drought. We're seeing the 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 the, the desertification. Uh, today, uh, we have 20 million people that are at the brink of death because of that starvation and thirst. And all these are impact of climate change. But beyond the, the impact that we're seeing, and that's also the paradox, uh, some of the largest solutions to climate change will come from the continent, especially when we look at the natural resources that the, the continent have. And more specifically, if we look at Gabon, that is in the Congo Basin, which is the, the lungs of Africa and the world's largest carbon sink today. And it's critical that uh, these new instrument and financial instrument come into the conversation if we really are to keep the 1.5 degree alive. Thank Sorry. you, Akim. Yes, no, thank you. Uh, that's, uh, that's yeah, absolutely. And, you know, as you said, the paradox is indeed that, you know, where the problems are, but the solutions are going to come exactly from there. And that's uh, something that I definitely want to spend some time talking about. But just before we get into that, uh, Hania, can I invite you to perhaps add your comments to what Akim has already shared, you know, giving us perhaps from the World Bank's perspective, uh, maybe a broader look at the continent and uh, maybe even a little bit of a deep dive, deep dive on some specific countries to add to what I've right. already shared. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Vinika. So I also would like to perhaps reframe the question. It's not only a climate challenge, but it's a climate and development challenge. As Akim said, I mean, the most stats have emissions from the continent at you know, three to 10%. And you know, we all know it's uh, often heard that it's most impacted, the continent is most impacted by the effects of climate change. And I'll just share a few statistics that we've put out at the World Bank group recently. So 100 million people internally displaced by climate change, 50 million people being pushed below the poverty line for reasons that are linked to, uh, to climate change and to changes in climate patterns. And to get even more granular, we have mitigation challenges, we have adaptation challenges, and climate change is amplifying the existing economic development challenges. So 
What's interesting is that on the mitigation side, the vast majority of emissions in the continent come from land use and land change in agriculture, about 60%. And that's very different from the profile of developed countries where the vast majority of emissions come from industry, power, and transportation. And that links to the point that I mentioned at the outset around the importance to look at this as both a climate and development challenge. So with this profile, we still have 600 million people in the continent without energy access. And almost a fifth of the continent's GDP comes from commodity exports, including fossil fuels. Um, so, and at the same time, more than 30% of the, of the continent's population lives in extreme poverty. So as we think about tackling and supporting countries in their climate development journey, just transition and really ensuring a low carbon pathway and low carbon and resilient pathway for development is critical. When we speak about climate change, we should also not forget about the adaptation side of the equation. Today, the continent's levels of adaptation and resilience are among the world's lowest, and a third of people at most risk from climate, climate change live in the continent. And basic data that actually would help us uh, identify solutions, so data about weather, weather patterns don't yet exist. And, and of course, as Akim mentioned, the impact of climate change on, on food security is a huge development challenge. Uh, we also have a financing challenge where public finances of governments are constrained and many African countries are at high risk of debt distress today, much also due to the aftermath of, of COVID. And there's also a huge gap between the climate funding needs and frankly, the pledged climate funding by developing countries. So all in all, I mean, the point that I um, really would like to leave the audience with is how do we think about considering climate challenges together with development challenges? At the World Bank, this is really the lens that we're taking in, in our work. And I look forward to also discussing you know, opportunities because I also do believe that despite all of these challenges, there are massive opportunities uh, to tackle the climate change challenge in the continent. Thank you, Hanya. And absolutely, as you say, you know, uh, we have to integrate the questions of climate and development. There's no question of being able to do one without the other. And, you know, sustainable development in a climate resilient fashion is, is of course, uh, going to be the focus of all solutions that we look at. Thank you for that. And actually, before I move on to um, a question to another panelist, you know, we've got um, a topical and very relevant question already from the audience. Claire Wheeler is asking about, so what is stopping Africa reaching its full potential in leading the world on climate change? Specifically, where are the financing gaps? Tanya, you started to speak about, you know, the, the, the aspect of the financing gaps. So do you want to perhaps take that question? And if anyone else from the panel would like to add to that, by all means. Yeah, I mean, I think what, what I would say here is what is stopping um, the, the continent. I mean, some of the challenges, some of the development challenges need to be absolutely tackled. So if we think about private sector investment, private sector investment in climate and non-climate, there are barriers that we need to unlock from improving the business enabling environment, from having security laws, bankruptcy laws. So a lot of the, the, the challenges and, and the investments that, that we need for climate require a business enabling environment that also requires a lot of funding, a lot of budget support, uh, balance of payment support as well uh, from, um, from the, the IMF. So it's really a holistic approach that needs to be taken. It's not just climate change. There's a lot more that we need to tackle as well. Absolutely. Would anyone like to add? James, were you going to say something? Uh, I thought I saw you move towards the sure. mic. Go ahead. Um, uh, uh, sure. And, 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 and maybe where I, would, where I would anchor it is I agree with Hania that these things are interlinked. I do think it's important to realize that part of the reason why so many Africans have been driven over the brink into from over the brink into real you know, survival mode by climate change is because they were so close to the line to begin with. 
And that in itself is a function of low productivity, low income economies, which themselves are a function of a very simple fact, which is African countries are at the bottom of every single global value chain that they participate in. I cannot think of a single product value chain in the world in which Africa receives raw materials and engages in value addition, which is where a lot of value and wealth is created for citizens, and then exports back out. Um, it all flows the other way. And so long as that is true, so long as that poverty trap continues, then African citizens continue to be the most energy poor in the world. And even as they get more efficient at primary production, if we can argue for intensification of agriculture rather than extensification, that so we're not cutting down our forests, et cetera, even doing that, so long as we're not moving value addition onto the continent, then we are only talking about how much less desperately poor can we get Africa, not how does Africa begin to transition into being an economic engine of growth. And that is the way that we need to think about climate and climate action is, is it an opportunity to make the argument for shifting greater amounts of, of value addition onto the continent, which it is, and we can get into that later, but that, that's where the opportunity is because all of the development finance in the world is not going to be sufficient. The quantums are dwarfed by the scale of the challenge. What we need is commercial investment into Africa that's good for the planet, and good for the continent that translates into the resilience and the growth that we need. Uh, and I can talk about the rationale for that, but I don't want to get in, you know, don't want to derail the conversation too early now. I think we'll get to it in subsequent conversation. Yeah, thank you, James. And Akim, uh, you wanted to add something? Yeah, sure. Uh, maybe just to nuance a little bit what has been said, or at least to, to paint maybe a brighter a brighter picture and share a case that happened in Gabon, where we were able to, in the timber industry, really to align that development challenges with still the maintaining the stewardship of the environment. In 2010, we decided to ban the export of rollocks, which was, uh, before we discovered oil, was, was the higher income partner for the country. And we did it one day to the other. And uh, we, that, was, that really was, uh, how would you say, negatively, negatively impacted our fiscal revenues in the country. And we also faced resistance from the, from the operators who had to move from being straight lock cutters to now industrials. But we knew back then that that was the decision to be taken. And now 10 years back, when we look back, few, 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 few elements, few outcomes, First of all, we reduce our deforestation rate by less than 0.1% today. That's the deforestation rate yearly in Gabon. Second of all, uh, the workers were able to move through the value chain and improve their livelihood because now we're having first and second transformation done locally. And third of all, we realized that doing that sustainable logging which means that we cut one tree every hectares every 25 years, we were able to increase the carbon absorption of our forest. So that was just an example of how we were able to align those two elements that can go without the other. We can't think of development without the environment, but also we have to look at the livelihood and social economic progress of um, the population on the continent. Indeed, and actually maybe this is a good time then to start talking about solutions, but uh, maybe before I go uh, to that next part of the question, uh, let's, let's ask Pauline. I know Pauline, you had something you wanted to say, go ahead. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say that while I agree with everyone, I think also one of the elements to realize we are excluding a majority of the population that could be actually you know, contributing to solving the challenges. And here I'm talking about women, to some extent the youth. I think we, we have um, a quite a good example to show how women, the youth are the future of the continent, but we're not including them. I think that there was a research that was published demonstrating how you know, uh, the climate change basically affect more negatively you know, women comparing it to men. And, and this is basically in the range of the course of uh, intersection around agriculture, production, food and nutri nutrition, healthcare, water, energy, 
climate related disaster, migration conflict, and you, name, you, you can name many of those. Uh, however, the good news is we have many women on the continent who are entrepreneurs who are actually working to solve those challenges. And, and I share equity, almost every woman we have backed is actually addressing one of those problems. Because I think one of the, the things we need to realize on the continent is that we should not just follow uh, the discussion around the climate change because it's trending, but we should look at on the ground, what can we do? Who can we work with? Who can we back? And what kind of solution we, we should be backing? So you, we're talking about investment, but again, African women on the continent, they face 42 billion gender funding gap. At the same time, they're driving 40% of SMEs on the continent. And again, when you look at the kind of businesses African women are you know, you know, creating, they're not just fancy businesses because they wanna be entrepreneurs. Each one of them actually is driven to solve a, a challenge. And when you are and pack challenges that women are solving on the continent, they actually intersect with the climate change. So I think we need to, as we reframe the question, we need to unpack also who is included, whose solutions are being packed and how collectively we can actually lead uh, solutions that are good for Africa, good for the planet, not just because we're following the rest of the world narrative. No, absolutely, Pauline. And that was definitely going to be my question to you, you know, to tell us because um, you work with a number of uh, women entrepreneurs in your various different uh, roles. And actually, I think you see some wonderful examples of what they're doing. Um, and as you said, you know, we are talking about sustainable development, which is climate resilient, but we have to be absolutely sure that it's not leaving anyone behind. And certainly women are a very important part of that equation. So maybe since you've been talking about this, this might be a good time to ask you to tell us a little bit about how we can then provide a solution. How do we counter the issues you're talking about, you know, in terms of being able to help um, amplify uh, the efforts of these women and sort of catalyze more support for them? Because you said, and I, I'm sure everyone here agrees that no climate change policy has any chance of success if it doesn't involve uh, all genders, right? So go ahead, please tell us more about what you were saying. So, so at She Equity, we uh, started investing about two years and a half, so still too early to give like impact in terms of the long-term pers perspective. But you know, some example of a company we invested in, the like of Echo Dudu in Kenya, that is focusing on producing like insect protein and organic fertilizer, right? So from that perspective, like the, one of the intention for them was really to say, how can we feed the future without harming the environment. And, and this is like a young people who basically working hard to find, to, to, you know, to design this solution, bring it to the market. But at the same times, they have to compete with many people to raise capital and to scale these solutions. And you have the like of shuttlers in Nigeria, which is like a mobility company that is you know, interested in moving more cars up from the street but promoting like a bus carpool for professionals. And those are just, you know, a few example. And I can add also the Fonio, you know, you know value chain. I, I, I don't know if some of the, the participants don't know about Fonio, I will say Google it. You will realize Fonio is a superfood uh, that is an African superfood, you know, only grow in desert, desert area, Sahara. And actually, um, it has been classified as one of the 50 best crop for people on the planet. It does not require water. Basically, it's the best food area. So right now, we are discussing about different crises, including the fact that uh, the war in Ukraine has led to shortage of wheat. We have an opportunity on the continent to actually find a funio because it's actually better than the wheat, right? But again, when you look at the phone, this is a very chain that's mostly led by women and most of the women in rural areas. So which again, you can see how backing women, you can be tapping into different areas that benefit everyone. And, and the, what women entrepreneurs on the continent are, are asking is basically pay a, you know, funding. And eventually, I think what we need to do is uh, to also, you know, find a company that can grow and scale, because if we can scale African solution, 
across the continent, but also on the global market, then we can remove one of the excuses, which is most of investors, I think they can't find the deals owned and led by women on the continent. We need to demonstrate actually they exist and the only way to do it is to fund them and support them to scale. Absolutely. Thank you, Pauline. Uh, and, you know, for sort of uh, making sure that we frame the question uh, as inclusively as possible. So thank you for that intervention. Um, and, you know, since we've started, started to talk about solutions, let me, you know, take a step back and perhaps James ask you to frame it for us uh, from a solutions perspective as to, you know, how do we then move the sort of um, the question from Africa being a victim of climate change to, as you started to say earlier, to becoming a solutions provider? For itself and also for the rest of the world, yeah. because we are beginning to see, as Pauline was saying, some innovative ideas that can be very useful. Absolutely, Vinika. And I think the, the starting point is saying, and firstly, it's always important to say there is no doubt, there should be no doubt in anyone's mind that Africa is going to be disproportionately negatively impacted and has, com and com and has contributed disproportionately little for the climate crisis. That's a given and that's a discussion that needs to be had and to continue to be had. However, that discussion sometimes dominates to the extent of obscuring the fact that because Africa has a young and growing population, a large workforce, if you will, combined with a large land mass and many natural resources, and combined with tremendous amounts of untapped renewable energy. Um, a recent analysis said, Africa today, um, most African countries have upwards of a thousand times, the renewable energy potential in most African countries is upwards of a thousand times current assessed energy demand. Uh, that's, the highest concept, that's the highest gap between renewable supply and renewable demand in the world. Now, of course, it's unrealized supply and it remains latent. But if you take those three things together, they open up three very distinct opportunities that are worth keeping in mind. The first is one of the cheapest, most cost-effective pathways for global capital to drive decarbonization by 2050 is ensuring that Africa, as it undergoes its development, doesn't go business as usual, but actually goes green from the start. And the reason for that is twofold. The first is look at any curves. And I mean, the war in the Ukraine has clarified this, but if you look at the cost per unit of energy onto any grid in, in certainly on the continent right now, technology advances have meant that the plunging prices of wind, solar, geothermal, and hydro are now sustainably below the cost of, of fossil fuel powered energy. That doesn't mean that there aren't cases where it makes sense to use the fossil fuel energy, but it becomes harder and harder from a greenfield standing start to say, well, the economics are obvious, let's go the other way. However, it's cheaper to, the fossil fuel power plants cost less upfront, but they cost something every day because you have to fuel them. Investing in Africa's green energy fleet plus helping Africa pivot to green building materials. Some of the work uh, Akeem and folks in Gabon are doing, looking at the role of timber in construction. If we can avoid carbon intensive, you know, concrete and steel, for example, and go straight to new technology. You take all of that together. And by 2050, we estimate 12 gigatons per year of emissions could be avoided just by helping Africa get to the green technologies first and not go through the, the cycle of redundancies and stranded assets. Secondly, if you've done that, then the second obvious opportunity is in producing for the world. And that ties to the point I was making earlier, which is today we are shipping chunks of Guinean mountain, right? We carve it, we crunch it into, into tiny particles and we ship it across the ocean to Asia and to Australia to be refined using carbon heavy energy into steel. That's just one example. You could say the same for cobalt. You could say the same for copper. You could say the same for aluminum. Just onshoring that, first of all, re vastly reduces the world's carbon demand from shipping. In addition to, if you're shifting towards green energy, actually reducing the amount of, of, of carbon dioxide emitted in purifying these major materials, including the transition minerals for the green transition. And then finally, it creates jobs where the workforce of the future is. Right now we have young Africans moving overseas in search of work, and yet they're sitting with all of the primary uh, enablers of that work right there close to hand. Investing in that solves multiple problems at the same time. 
And maybe the last thing I'll say, and the last piece of this is we need to recognize that while the technologies are starting to pick up a lot faster than people may have expected even a few years ago, we still left it too late. The transition, the green transition has started a little bit too late and we are going to overshoot. That means that we will need to think very carefully about how we pull some of that surplus carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Current estimates say that by 2050, we need to pull down no less than 200 billion tons of carbon dioxide, right? The global, energy, the global oil and gas industry every year manages to pull out 6 billion tons. We're saying we need to put back in 200 billion. That's a massive task. Some of that will be done by the Congo Basin and by expanding our nature-based sinks and by working with farmers to increase soil carbon and so on, which needs to be motivated by carbon markets, which need to work for Africans rather than being something that's out there in a, in a separate narrative. If you're doing a, a, pub, a global public good, you should be compensated for it. And some of it will require new technologies, which themselves likely have their best and most productive homes on the continent. So those are the three ways that Africa can play a crucial role. Go green from the start, produce for the world and drive climate competitiveness as a way to attract production and attract the jobs that we need for the world's largest workforce. And then finally deploy some of that workforce towards both stewarding, supporting nature and building new approaches to sequestering and capturing carbon at scale. Wonderful. Very succinctly picked, uh, put in absolutely. I mean, going green from the start, whether, you know, as you were telling me in a previous conversation, we're talking about, you know, being most uh, having sustainable solutions for cooking in the African kitchen to perhaps, you know, transportation on the African roads. I mean, there are important points to be covered in each of these aspects, right? Yes, absolutely. Thank you, James. And you touched upon forests. And I think that brings me to, to um, ask Akim uh, the question that, you know, I think a lot of us have interest in, and I'm already seeing questions from the audience on that. Now, Gabon, uh, Akim, has become a model of environmental policy, right? I mean, this, the work that's been done in terms of earning carbon credits uh, in the forest um, if you had to look at one case study on a successful climate action, I think, you know, we, that's one to pick, right? That would be my pick. And given that you've obviously been an integral part of this, um, and because not everyone's completely familiar with it, can you t tell us about uh, how this was brought about and also a little bit perhaps about the tools that can be mobilized to ensure that, you know, what's happened at Gabon can be replicated? Thank you, Benika. Um, and I already apologize maybe for being over optimistic or biased since we're talking about Gabon. Uh, maybe it's important that I give you also some element of the background because it, all this didn't happen overnight. It's really the result of uh, 50 years of consistent groundbreaking policies that have been put in place in the country. As we like to say, uh, Gabon has invested in the environment space uh, even before environment became something or a topic or subject. Uh, 1960, we created the first Ministry of Environment uh, in Gabon. Uh, after Rio 1992, we had our first um, environmental law. And in 2006, uh, the government decided to create uh, a network of national park that covered 12% of our land mass. This, this is really to say, how seriously uh, this topic was taken by our forefathers and continued by the various government that were in place. And what happened is, um, as I mentioned earlier, in 2010, we decided to ban the export of rollouts. So we were born now, 10 years later, uh, we were, let's say we were sitting in 2018, and we could realize that over that period of time, over those eight years, we were able to reduce our emissions. So which enable us to today have 90 million tons of carbon credits, UNFCC Red Plus certified. But the whole idea around it is to really stress the fact that today investing in those sovereign carbon credit, which is the first ever uh, the largest first ever uh, carbon credit emission led by a sovereign wealth fund is really investing in the future of the population and the future of the planet. Because as it was mentioned before, we're seeing technology, we're seeing projects where we're replanting trees, but the reality is we won't save the planet just by replanting trees. 
um, uh, James mentioned it earlier, uh, the, the magnitude of the emissions that we have to absorb back. Uh, so today, uh, the reality is by doing this, we will be saving the, the Congo Basin. And maybe to emphasize also the importance and the fact that the Congo Basin is really one of our critical line of defense against climate change. Today, the Congo Basin transferred the atmospheric rivers to the Blue Nile. So basically, we lose Gabon, we lose the Congo Basin. We lose the Congo Basin, we lose the Blue Nile. And when we say we lose the Blue Nile, it's, we will negatively impact, and it's already happening, the, the whole agricultural ecosystem in Egypt. So now we're talking 100 million of climate refugees. So this is really uh, the, 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 what is at stake here. And by so today, um, we will be, uh, the Sovereign Wealth Fund has the mandate to monetize those 19 million carbon credits. Uh, but we also, every year, absorbing 140 million tons of carbon, and the country emit 35 million tons of carbon. So we're one of the few countries in the world which is absorbing more than is emitting in terms of, uh, <clears throat> in terms of uh, carbon emissions. And um, you mentioned also what, what is missing in terms of financial instruments. It's really... Today, the market is not fit for purpose when we're talking about the carbon market. When we look at the voluntary carbon market last year in 2021, um, 200 million tons were traded. When today we have more than 50 billion tons of emissions every year. So we clearly see that the market is not fit for purpose. We need scale and we need speed. So that's why um, we really believe that uh, this type of, um, how do you call it, a natural solution uh, which Gabon is bringing to the table is really critical. And um, we should all call to come together and ensure that this is a success. Because if Gabon wins, the, the African continent will succeed. And if the African continent succeeds, the world will reap the benefits. Um, also, to, to quickly close on this, because I know I can talk a lot about this, uh, this, uh, this issue, is really to stress the fact that with this first carbon issuance, there's also a signal that is being sent to the other high forest, low deforestation countries to ensure that we put a fair price on the living trees. Centuries ago, someone put a price on the dead tree, and was the beginning of the timber industry. Now we have to ensure that we're putting a fair price on the living tree so that we can keep those trees alive. Oh man, that is absolutely beautiful, uh, you know, putting a price on a living tree. And as you said, it didn't happen overnight. It took 50 years and, you know, it requires that kind of time and effort. Now we have a couple of questions on Gabon, uh, but perhaps first, uh, you know, something on what you started to speak about in terms of, are we ready uh, in many ways for uh, carbon uh, removal from forests? So um, we have a question from Professor Prashant Yadav, who's the academic director of INSEAD's Africa Initiative. Um, and, you know, he's asking actually about this, about the role of forests in carbon sequestration, uh, carbon removal, which, as you mentioned, is very important in Africa. And his question is that, do you think we have the right finance instruments to pay for forest-based carbon removal? Shouldn't we be thinking very boldly now about how to pay for this instead of just addressing marginally through existing concessional finance and modest grant mechanisms? Which is what- Totally. About. Yeah, totally. I think I mentioned it totally. Today, the market, uh, first of all, grant and donation, that's not the way to go about it. And I think James mentioned it. There's a, there's a ecosystem services that is being rendered to the planet, which has a cost of opportunity. We're not talking about grants or subsidies here. Um, Gabon could have went the other way. We saw some countries that were carbon sink 10 years ago. Today, they're net emitter. Uh, we clearly decided not to go that way. Uh, Gabon is one of the few, uh, I mean, it's the only country in the world that is member of the OPEP and also can claim to be a green superpower. It's a clear decision. We could have overexploited our forest, but we chose not to. Now we're not asking the world to pay us for preserving the forest. We're asking the world to provide us the financial mean 
to keep the planet alive. That's the conversation we're having here. That's one. And second, obviously, the market itself, like I mentioned today, is not fit for purpose. We need to find instruments so that we can offset more than 100 million tons of, we need to reduce emission by 50 billion every year. This is the conversation we're having. And so I totally agree. I totally agree. And that's why we're putting a lot of uh, hope in that in our carbon issues. And uh, we, we're already having some positive prospects. And uh, we convinced that uh, the world to market uh, will, will, will confirm uh, those uh, first intention that we're receiving from the market and mainly from the most polluting uh, uh, enterprise or most emitting companies in the world. Okay, and um, you know, there's uh, more interest in Gabon and, and a few more specific questions. But just before I go there, I want to check with the other panelists if there's anything that you'd like to add or comment on what Akim's been talking about, perhaps from your perspective or uh, knowledge on what's happening elsewhere in Africa. I think maybe I'll just briefly jump in. I mean, I, I'm a big believer and here at the bank, we're big believers in the potential role of carbon markets and carbon credits to really help mobilize finance at scale for climate action. I do agree with Akim that the market today is not where we want it to be, but I'm actually quite optimistic for a couple of reasons. One, um, with the expected growth in voluntary carbon markets and the expected demand from corporations that have met net zero goals, I really think we have an, a potential to introduce new um, carbon assets, new as, as opposed to just have all the demand chase, the 200 million uh, carbon credits that you know Akeem mentioned, I think this, this year it doubled, but we're still, it's marginal, it's 2 billion this, this year. So there really is a, a, an opportunity to really think creatively and we're seeing that happen. I was very excited about the announcement earlier this year um, uh, to, fi to finance technological carbon removals and corporations made a commitment to, to offtake carbon uh, removals coming from co companies that don't even yet exist. This is the On Frontier Climate Finance Initiative that was announced earlier this year. And I think we can take that model and think about ways to monetize emission reductions from other categories of activities. Think about coal decommissioning, you know, soil organic carbon. And there are a lot of conversations that are happening exactly in this vein to say today's market may be very constraining. SBTI has very strict guidelines about what constitutes a net zero claim by corporations. But don't we have an opportunity today to think creatively and tap into this demand to finance, you know, to, to um, keep trees alive, but also to finance some of the world's greatest opportunities for mitigation, such as coal, uh, such as um, coal decommissioning, and uh, more broadly in the forestry sector as well. Indeed, uh, absolutely. Thank you for that, Hania. And um, just before I um, uh, go on to give James an opportunity to talk, I I've just been asked to remind uh, our audience to keep sending in your questions. Uh, it's through the Q and A box, please. Some of you might be attempting to send them in through chat, which has been disabled. So if you could just send in your questions uh, in the Q&A box. Thank you. James, over to you. You wanted to add to, um, to what has been said? Yeah, I do note, I, I think Pauline was actually wanting to come in before I did. Um, and I know I've, I've, I've had a couple of bites of the, of the apple. Okay, so thank she wants you, James. To go first. Pauline, uh, over to you in that case. Thank you, James. Thank you so much, James. And, and I think your mind is really more like a uh, follow-up questions to this conversation to make sure that we don't lose the focus because I love everything we're saying here. It sounds good. It's probably doable. But how do we make sure that this does not become just like a conversation that seems to be... It seems to be like, you know, elites discussing about things that can transform the future. So today, like as someone in a rural area who's hungry, who is being affected by the reality, and there's a, an entrepreneur, sorry, and, and there's an entrepreneur next door who is actually creating a solution 
that's solving this. I think we need to look at macro level in terms of what we're discussing in the micro. And the macro is everything we're discussing here. I think um, Gaboy case is very concrete, very clear. But at the same time, the reality on the continent is really at the intersection between climate change and, and healthcare and the food security and everything else. So, so I guess concretely, I would love us, if possible, to be saying, hey, here are actions we can take on the continent so we can see immediate change in lifestyle for our people, which by the way, uh, you know, again, the local entrepreneurs who are only asking for financing are doing this. What are we doing as Africans ourselves, uh, as a country's policy to actually put that seed capital? Because some of the discussion is always like, yeah, investors from outside are not coming in, right? But we know they're not coming in because of all the perceived risk. And, and so for me, like this, we need to zoom in to look at the reality beyond just climate change. Because the reality of everyone, it's what they feel when they're hungry, when they're sick. And also a, a young person who's working hard, a woman who's creating a solution and is not being funded just because they are in Africa, because they look like an African. So over to you, James. <laughs> Thank you. Well, that's actually a perfect segue because I think that it's important to understand tangibly what a huge difference high functioning carbon markets can make. And I'll, and I'll highlight a few very concrete examples of what's happening today and, what we, and then what we need to do to get them to work better. Um, the first one is biggest, biggest killer of women in Africa today is indoor air pollution uh, because of particulate matter from uh, traditional cooking methods. In addition, it's one of the biggest contributors to the land use based deforestation that Hania characterized as one of the biggest sources of Africa's uh, climate impact. There are, the carbon markets are willing to, there's, there's been a willingness to support the cleaning up of cooking, but there haven't been the business models for doing it. And I think what has tended to happen is one of the flaws of the carbon market is that because only people outside of the continent have understood them and engaged with them, you've seen ridiculous models such as, you know, someone goes and collects $10 or $5 a ton back in the day for, uh, from, you know, from the carbon markets buys you know, a few cleaner jikos, um, hands them out without any training or anything else, doesn't do anything else, takes a picture of all the people they've given the jiko to, spends 10% of the money on that, collects the other 90% and says, you know, I'm cleaning up cooking. Instead of actually figuring out what does it take to get a consumer to change their behavior, to adopt something that works for them, what are they looking for and so on. And some of that is because people on the continent and understanding what are the business models behind removing biomass or dirty and sustainable biomass from cooking. Once you understand that, then suddenly the business you were running before trying to sell a cooking solution was leaving behind concrete dollars that could be available in hard currency to support your, the revenue line of your business. To your point, Pauline, you know, raising capital from outside is difficult. You need local currency capital. But if you have hard currency revenue lines, suddenly you can mobilize all kinds of different capital for scaling up and that also attracts local capital. And I've seen that, you know, the opportunity in particular in clean cooking amounts to hundreds of millions of tons of avoided emissions every year, not to mention the saved lives, not to mention the improved convenience because of all the time that is spent in, in gathering firewood and so on. You can apply the same logic to irrigation. Today, with the adaptation challenges, we're going to need to move away from, from, uh, from rain-fed agriculture. And yet, paying for irrigation is expensive. The subsidy that's available from the gap between the cost of irrigating using diesel versus irrigating using solar is enough to bring some solar irrigation pumps within the reach of farmers who would not otherwise be able to invest in them. Now, that is not the farmer themselves understanding how the carbon markets work. It's about an entrepreneur saying, how do I translate the fact that I'm selling a green product into a carbon credit that then lowers the price to drive adoption and then increases my revenue because actually I'm, I'm gaining my revenue from the carbon. There's a number of these examples of early stage businesses that actually the area where I am most excited now is how do we create carbon, carbon revenue streams or carbon uh, financing that actually accelerates businesses that serve the grassroots and serve mass markets. However, we need to fix a couple of things. The first one is, and this one I always shake my head and grit my teeth, is Akeem has a problem. 
Gabon is doing a great job protecting its forests and the world is going to tell him, we can't pay you for that because you're doing it anyway, right? There's no additionality in paying Gabon for the carbon that it is sequestering for the planet. In other words, good behavior is penalized. I almost feel like we need to hire a team of people with chainsaws to go and stand next to trees and say, okay, now can we sell carbon credits? We're not, we weren't gonna cut them down, but now you can see there's an imminent threat. So that's the first thing. How do we move the discussion about carbon to saying, let's recognize the work people are doing, whether they were being paid for it before or not. The second one is it's a messed up market. It's an over-intermediated market. By some estimates, for every dollar spent on uh, to, to buy a carbon credit on the global markets from Africa, 20 cents might make it to the local communities or the people on the ground doing the work. The rest goes to brokers, verifiers, transaction structurers, basically all the people who don't live in the place where this work is being done. And we need to fix that. And we need to fix that by understanding what these steps are, demystifying them, and allowing young Africans to say, I want to run a carbon verification business. It's not rocket science. We have the training. We have the knowledge. We just need to demystify it so that more value flows through to the end receiver. And then I think finally, there's a question about how do we make sure that the voluntary carbon market, which is moving fast and already putting money in Africans' hands, is allowed to continue even as we scale up the compliance market, which will be between governments. Because I think we know that a lot of the innovation will come from entrepreneurs figuring out a way in, in a small community somewhere to say, I can protect this mangrove forest and I can even expand it. That's an entrepreneurial decision. And we need a way to invest in that and support that before we then get into now the state coming in and saying, well, this is a, a government to government transition transaction. Both of those things can happen, right? And both of those things have their place. We can't allow just one or the other to be the dominant one. So those are three things that I think need to work about the carbon markets, but it's all Pauline to your point. How do we create new streams of revenue? for African businesses or to subsidize African products? And then how else do we lower the cost of attracting investment or the lower the cost of capital for African businesses that do have a carbon component to them? Thank you, James. Um, and you know, I wanna make sure uh, in, the, in the sort of two minutes that we have left to give Akeem a chance to answer a couple of very specific questions that did come up on Gabon. So uh, Jeremy is asking about, does Gabon have a technology action plan? And if so, uh, does FGIS intend to support the financing of technologies identified to reduce, mitigate the effects of climate change? And a question from Tiffany, uh, which I think is uh, particularly interesting given you know, the young people who are watching in the audience, as the exclusive manager of Gabon's cre carbon credits portfolio, what can you tell us about the areas that the Gabonese youth should specialize in to become climate change subject matter experts or solution providers? Thank you, Tiffany. A uh, very important question, I know. Um, Akim, can I ask you to respond very quickly? Uh, if you don't mind, we just have a couple of minutes left in the in the webinar. Thank you. Yeah, sure, sure, Vinika, and thank you for 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 for, for those questions uh, from the audience. Uh, on the first one, on the technology, um, obviously, James mentioned, for instance, uh, with the work that we're doing in the timber industry to see how we can uh, develop cross laminated timber to replace uh, concrete and iron in uh, construction. But on that one, I, will, I can't stress enough that every country has to play to its forces. Uh, we already have the best technology ever. We have the forest that is absorbing the carbon. How do we maintain that forest? That's really where uh, Gabon is focusing its effort on and not really on new technology that will take out maybe lesser amount of carbon than the forest is already doing. And on the second one, from Tiffany on the youth, I think we should also demystify the issue of climate change in the sense that it's not a specific area. And the reality is if someone today comes to me and tells me that he's an expert in climate change, there's chances that I will run away because uh, this is really, uh, really, we're all learning and we're all driving our car as we're building it. And um, I believe that here we really have to understand how we can move through the value chain on the continent. How can we localize our industry in the continent? So climate change doesn't really fit in one specific place. It's across sectors. It's across uh, academia. It's across the civil society. It's really understanding that how can we reduce our emissions? 
And quickly, quickly, one quick one, uh, Benita, if you're low, uh, just to um, resonate on what um, James mentioned. We have the issue of carbon and how can we uh, monetize our carbon sequestration by the forest. But there's also another element, which is the elephant in the room that we didn't touch upon today is really the, the role that the development bank and let's say the global north financial sector is playing when it comes to energy transition, for instance. And we had the discussion about gas, I believe, James in New York, where uh, two years ago, it was impossible to finance a gas project on the continent, being that it was not clean and that uh, we should, uh, international bank were not financing those. And now with the, the situation in Ukraine, we have that convenient compromise now where banks are willing to look into it. But what will happen in five years? And this is not a pick at Anya, not at all, but it's just like what we've seen. And talking about um, carbon re removal or um, carbon emission reduction, uh, we, we, we have a case in gas capturing Gabon is still flaring gas. And since 1998, we committed to reduce our gas flaring by 30%. But we're still flaring that gas because we don't have any outcome for it. So we went to some banks two years ago to finance a gas capture project. And they told us, oh, sorry, we can't finance it, it's gas. But the reality is by financing that project, we will reduce deforestation that people are cutting trees for cooking. That's one. Um, we will reduce the emission of the gas that is being flared in the atmosphere, because we will reuse it to do gas to power. So at some point also, we need to contextualize uh, what we really mean by the, the battle against climate change. And what it means for Africans might be different to what it means for the global north. Indeed. Thank you. And, and thank you for that acumen. Thank you for answering all the questions uh, quickly and succinctly. And we are out of time, though we're getting interesting questions and comments from the audience. Um, so as we've heard, you know, Africa is obviously facing challenges related to a climate change catastrophe that it did not cause. And yet we're seeing that its own people are best placed uh, to find solutions to this problem, not just for themselves, but for others to benefit from. And we've heard of a few uh, very interesting examples uh, today. Uh, we've also understood, uh, and Pauline made this point, that uh, everyone across genders and any other divisions that you know mankind has created needs to be committed and needs to be included as we make these changes happen. Not just to save the beautiful and diverse continent of Africa, but in fact to save the planet. So I want to say thank you to our audience for a great engagement and excellent questions. And of course, a very big thank you to our panelists for your candid sharing today and for all the work that you're doing, um, work that we're all inspired by. And thank you for making time to be with us today. Um, I also want to um, remind everybody that uh, we have um, you know, uh, another full day of SDG week programming and Jean will put up that slide for us to remind you of what's coming up uh, tomorrow as we say um, goodbye for now. And thank you once again to our panelists for joining us today. Thank you, Pauline, Akeem, James, and Hania. Pleasure to have had you. Thank you. you.